Welcome to the E-Commerce Optimizer Show. I'm your host, Scott Reed. This episode is brought to you by E-Commerce Optimizers. We specialize in helping e-commerce brands in one focused area, and that's making your website easier to use so that more of your visitors buy from you. Now, an easy-to-use website delivers a highly intuitive, straightforward, and smooth experience throughout the customer journey, making it much easier and more enjoyable to do business with you. Now, this translates into a wide variety of business building benefits, including increased revenue, higher profits, and happier, loyal customers who buy from you time and time again. Now, if you'd like to learn more about how we make e-commerce sites easier to use and how our services might benefit your business, head on over to our website at ecommerceoptimizers.com and check out all the details. So today on the podcast, we have Ben Billups of Noble Digital. Ben, thanks very much for joining me today. Um, I really appreciate it. Where, and you're coming from, uh, you're calling in, where you're from, I, I believe, Austin, Texas. Is that correct? That's right. Yeah, excited to be here. I appreciate you having me on, Scott. Yeah, how long have you uh, been in the Austin area? Are you a, a native Texan? I'm a, I'm a unicorn in the city. I was born here. And so that means when I go to events, everybody says, there he is. We found him because there's been so many people <laughs> moving here the last couple of years. Almost everybody you meet is a transplant. Uh, but yeah, yeah I'm, a, I'm a real Austinite. That's a great city, isn't it? Yeah. No, it's, it's phenomenal. It's one of the most unique in the world. I have a ton of appreciation for it, especially the east side. There's nothing like the east side in any other city I've ever visited. Yeah, I, uh, I've never been, but I am a big Formula One fan, and it is on my list to go uh, watch the F1 race at the uh, at the track. Have you ever been? I have, yeah. No, it, it's a great experience. And you know what comes out today, because we're recording on February 23rd. It's the uh, sixth season of Drive to Survive, but I digress. Um <laughs> So why don't you tell us about yourself, Ben? We, uh, you know, I, I believe, and we had a little conversation before we, uh, before we started recording. And and uh, personally, my takeaway is that anybody who's in a direct to consumer e-commerce uh, business and even B two B would be very, very, uh, it would be a very good, solid use of your time to listen to this episode, because Ben, what we're going to talk about today, what he has to, to bring to the table and, and his level of knowledge and experience, and just his overall professional delivery is something that I, I, I know before we even get into it, that it's going to be a great episode. So why don't you tell us about yourself, Ben? Yeah, 100%. Uh, so like the two-minute history there is, I mean, after I graduated college, I was just very much a marketing generalist. Um, I worked at a bunch of different startups. Ed tech, news media, doing a bunch of different things, um, just like pretty typical for any new marketer, one man band in an underfunded organization, kind of learning how all the pieces go together, which I think was really valuable experience for me um, and working in a bunch of different industries, which I enjoyed tremendously. And then eventually, like kind of the, uh, the aha moment for me was I, I worked for a, a big e-commerce brand called Bellamy, which sells hair extensions. And you know, managed to, to really see some revenue uh, come through their email and their SMS channel. So, and that was a, a more specialized role for me. I was doing exclusively their email. I opened up their SMS channel and I was doing a little bit of their website CRO as well. Um, they got acquired about a year after I joined. Mm -hmm. I started taking clients on on the side after that, had like a big case study with Bellamy. And, uh, and then since then, I mean, we support a pretty diverse range of clients across e-commerce, news publishing, B2B, uh, but all of it for us is email and SMS. We're like total email nerds. I just completely went down the rabbit hole uh, and learned everything that I could about it. So uh, it's something that I like legitimately, I love it. Well, the, and, and with email, there's an awful lot to learn. I mean, it sounds easy, but it's uh, the devil's in the details of email. Could you could you talk about that and some of the, the ways in which, um, you know, email is uh, kind of like buyer beware and or ways that you can leverage email to, to really, um, you know, exponentially grow your, your, uh, your, your e-com brand. hundred percent. I mean, I, in a lot of ways, I think there's many brands out there that sort of undervalue it as a channel be, precisely because from the outside, it seems kind of simplistic. It's like, all right, like let's send a weekly newsletter or we're doing our black Friday promotion. We should tell our list about that. Right. And mm -hmm. that's true. That's, those are things that you should do. Um, but there's so much to be had with email marketing um, and a big part of it, the way that I really look at it is 
the uh, and, and I mean, it's a popular saying, right, that the, the revenue is in the list. And so a big thing that we focus on with any client, pretty much regardless of industry or what they're doing specifically, is we focus a ton on list growth. And, like, there's a variety of different tools, data vendors. There's ways you can optimize your opt-in pop-ups. Um, you know, all this, all these new identity resolution softwares that are popping up that can help you identify anonymous users and trigger abandoned cart emails, right? There's all kinds of stuff that you can get into that are all directly tied to email marketing. And part of the reason why I think that it's something that almost any brand can benefit from putting more resources behind is because the ROI is so ridiculously high. I mean, the, the common statistic you hear is that email marketing has an ROI of like 36. Sometimes I, I see it said that it's 41x ROI, right? It's ridiculous. And, and so and Facebook hasn't had, a, had that ROI since like 2012, right? Exactly. <laughs> if, exactly. If, any, if ever. Exactly. Yeah, the golden days when you could uh, set up an Alibaba dropshipping shop and spend $500 on ads, right? right. Um, but And it's like email really is that money printer, and it's been that way for two decades. And even when you look at the aggregated trends, it's like the email mark revenue from email marketing for like US based businesses, B2B or B2C, is just like a linear growth curve over the course of two decades. Yeah. Yeah. And and the thing with um with Facebook or any type of paid traffic, it it all requires, especially if you're scaling and you really want to grow your list and, and grow your, your uh your revenue using those those traffic channels, is that it uh, consumes a massive amount of, of a very, very uh, valuable scarce resource, which is cash. And yep. so, you know, laying out in many cases, some of the many of the clients that you and I work with, they're, they're shelling out hundreds of thousands of dollars a month, millions of dollars a month in paid traffic um, expenses. Whereas email, as you point out, with such a incredibly high ROI, doesn't require that at all. I mean, it's it's relatively it's like a it's like a speck on the on on the on the income statement. Um, yeah. So you know that being said, in in terms of in terms of that ROI, thirty six forty one percent ROI or, or not percent but X ROI. How do you generate that? I mean, what are your what are your um, what are the tactics that you employ to generate that type of ROI for your clients? Yeah. And and to be clear, I'm I'm fairly certain that that figure is based purely on, you know, the um, you know assuming that it's not taking into account the cost of traffic. Yeah. Right? There's no way that it's taking that into account. Right. Then you're getting you know free opt-ins off the list. They're not exactly free. Yeah. But then it's really factoring in basically the cost of sending emails, which in most email platforms is pennies on the dollar for reaching right. the same audience. Right. So it's like your CPM on Facebook versus your CPM on email is like massively different. Right. It's way right. cheaper to email your list. So, I mean, yeah, but I mean, speaking in terms of e-com brands and a lot of people that have spent time in, in email and SMS marketing know that it pretty much all comes down to list growth, um, automations. And, and really the, the key of automations is understanding your triggers. Like what are the high intent behaviors of users on your website? And then how, what, like what messaging are you sending based on those intent triggers? Um, and then your campaigns and promotions. So like your promotional cadence which that's another kind of black box where, you know, it, let's say a brand is sending, you know, one or two emails a week um, with different offers or different content that's valuable to their audience, and they're seeing good revenue from that, and they're not spending much to get that revenue, right? But there's actually, uh, there's a lot of theories around how do you structure which email to which segment, how you define the segments, what exactly is your email cadence? And then especially during promotions, and this is something we can dive into later as well, like what is an ideal promotional cadence? How do you structure that? So if it's Black Friday and you're running this for, you know, two or three weeks, how do you actually just determine who's receiving which emails on which days? Um, there's, a, there's a lot of ways that you can kind of go down the rabbit hole with that. And I mean, I've seen that happen before where we come in with a brand. They had a promotional cadence before that like wasn't bad. It was like maybe more typical it's like you send an email at the beginning, like maybe one or two in the middle and one at the end. But if you if you have a more refined promotional cadence, um, you can actually tremendously increase the amount of revenue that you're making just in a promotional period through email marketing. Right. So there's like lots of topics that you can get into in terms of expertise within those things. Um, but from the outside, they look deceptively simple. Right. So it's it's the structure. So what you're bringing to your to your clients, it sounds like is a is a like a proprietary structure that you've developed over the years that is going to 
um, improve the way in which they're communicating with the with the humans that are on their list. Is that a correct assumption that it's it's the the devils in the details, it's the structure and it's the proprietary nature of that? One hundred percent. And and that and that the kind of same theories that you develop around email cadence can also apply to your automations. It's like so you've identified an intent trigger. Like how quickly do you message them and how, like how big are the gaps between emails and how many emails are there, right? Like if you experiment with those things, sometimes you can dramatically increase the amount of revenue that certain automations generate. Now, if we were to, to back up a little bit and, and think about a, uh, a potential client of yours or a current client and think about and go back in time when, when your, your average I guess prospect comes to you. What state is their email um, is their email strategy in typically? And I, I, clearly, this doesn't apply to everybody. But what does that typically look like? Yeah. So I mean, there's usually we identify pretty clear room for growth in all areas. Um, so I mean, the first thing we look at is list growth. And I mean, I've worked with prospects before that are making a tremendous amount of money through email marketing already. But then if you actually like get into their list growth, their unsubscribes are outpacing their subscribes. So you're like, okay, well, I mean, this is a kind of a time bomb, right? Like yeah. if you just let this roll on forever, um, your, your revenue is just going to continue to decrease because your audience is shrinking, right? Yeah. So there's always, there's pretty much always revenue there in terms of, you know, even if you're just doing simple opt-in units, it's like, are you actually testing the offers? And then are you actually measuring how much revenue are we generating within a certain time frame per offer? Right. And then which offer is actually most aligned with the goals of that brand? Some brands, they actually benefit from lower intent opt in offers where it's like we just want as many people on our list as possible. And we're going to we don't care if we convert them in six or 12 months. Right. right. And then other brands, if they're prioritizing short term revenue, it's like, OK, well, maybe we collect fewer emails, but we work with higher intent offers where um, we know that they're going to convert in 14 days or 30 days. Right. Mm -hmm. So there's that's something to take into account. And that tends to be the first thing we look at is just, just the list growth profile and what are the opt-in units. And then uh, the next thing we look at is the automations. Um, and pretty much every brand that I see, I mean, some brands, we come to them and we recommend that we add eight to 10 different automations. Because, um, I mean, if, if you've just set up the basics, which definitely setting up the basics is better than no automations. But if you're just running, let's say, an abandoned uh, cart series, and a welcome series, right? It's like there's a lot more that you can be doing with automations, right? Mm -hmm. um, and and I've pretty much never audited an account and seen them running all the automations I think they should be. Right. Um, so then that's one. And then the other, of course, is your is your actual email campaigns, your promotional cadence. Um, and, and this is another area where, you know, maybe a controversial idea, but there's a lot of brands out there that could just be sending more emails. And uh, mm -hmm. the math on that is pretty simple. If if you if you're able to even increase your send volume by thirty percent, right, you'll be able to see more revenue come through your email campaigns. Now, if we if we um, start at the top on that with the list growth profile, do, do, is what you do does that include um, growing the list and strategies to grow to, to grow their list? And could you talk about that? Please? Yeah, absolutely. So, and and really, like when I was talking about opt-in offers, there's there's a, there's, you can get into like more creative ways to do it, but it really comes down to two basic structures for your offers. Um, one is essentially giveaways, right? And that, that's going to be your lower intent offer. So if you, let's say every week you give away one of your hero products to a lucky winner, right? That's going to be a lower intent offer because you may be getting a lot of email addresses from people who they have a passing interest in your brand, but they may not actually have intent to buy. Right. Mm -hmm. um, and, and actually, I've seen that be tremendously valuable. So it's something I wouldn't just discount it right away. But then the kind of the most common higher intent offer is just going to be things like free shipping or a discount on a specific product or a site discount uh, in exchange for someone entering their email. If they're interested enough in your products that that a, you know, let's say a 20 percent discount is interesting to them they're going to be more likely to buy within a shorter period of time and actually use that coupon code, right? So, but also typically you'll see fewer opt-ins with that than you would with something like a giveaway. And and like I said, you can get into, I mean, there's lots of marketers these days talking about like zero party data, essentially like pushing surveys, asking them more information about them, doing quizzes and whatnot. And there's value in that as well. But typically it falls into kind of like one of those two categories and we'll make different recommendations based on the brand's goals. 
Um, the other big area for list growth, and this is by far like the um, the one that, that adds sort of exponential, it adds an exponential to your list growth, is a lot of these new identity resolution tools, yeah. which um, they're CAN-SPAM compliant and CCPA compliant. So that means they're U.S. only. It's, it's not for European brands right now. Um, but no GDPR. Are, is, that's exactly. not going to fly in Europe, right? Yeah. Exactly. Um, but, you know, retention.com, revenue roll, like there's a couple of vendors out there. And we typically do recommend those. If a site is getting, say, 30 or 40,000 plus unique users from the U.S. per month, uh, the number of emails you can collect from anonymous users is massive. Like it's going to dramatically outpace almost any other email collection effort. And you obviously want to be thoughtful with how you handle those emails on the uh, on the back end just because they aren't explicit opt-in. So you want mm-hmm. to make sure you're setting yourself up for success and deliverability. But almost nothing beats it in terms of a cost per email and like a list growth uh, from that perspective. Now, in terms of um, we talk, you, I really find it intriguing how you talked about those low low intent offers like a giveaway and the high intent, which would be free shipping or discounts. Is there kind of like a baseline discount that you that you st- is a standard recommendation? Yeah, I mean, I, I think this actually goes more to like pricing theory and like how you structure promotions in general, but. I mean, a good rule of thumb is that if a discount is lower than 20%, it doesn't tend to motivate um, yeah. users. And if a discount is higher than 40%, users tend to think that your products are maybe garbage or it's too good to be true. Uh, so that anywhere in that 20 to 40% tends to be the sweet spot. Um, but sometimes with higher AOV or lower margin items, uh, it still makes sense to do something less than that. But mm-hmm. it just, you know, it, you take into account the fact that it, it's just not going to be as interesting. And the reality is, is that you can test it. It's not like it's it's cast in stone. You can exactly you can change it. It doesn't doesn't cost much to change the uh, the incentive on that. Um, is there specific? Um, it, w- one of the things that that I always um, am sem- sensitive to personally is is the expectation that you're setting with somebody for any type of an offer. Um, do you really make it explicit that it's just that one time? Or is that do, do do you see nuances with that, like in terms of really drilling down, like this one time offer for twenty percent? And this may be getting a little bit too much into the nitty gritty, but if, is there any uh, commentary that you have on that? Yeah, I mean, I would say generally speaking, that is the best practice is to make it a one time coupon code and to make sure that that's something that they know up front. Yeah. Um, because that gives them a degree of urgency, especially if you set an expiration date. Let's say, yeah. you know, give us your email, get a 20% off code. It expires in 48 hours, right? Okay. You're going to get more conversions that way than structuring a different way. But you also want to make sure that you're taking into account essentially the profile of all offers across your brand. So it's like yeah. you don't want to run into a situation where you're basically giving a better deal to prospects than you are to customers or right. that your pop-up offer is beating your Black Friday offer, right? You don't want right. to do that. Um but yeah, something pretty simple like that can be effective. Now, in terms of the the new identity uh, re- resolution, could you could you talk about that? Yeah. So there's a bunch of these vendors in the space popping up. Uh, the one that we've worked with the most is Retention.com. We're uh, we're piloting Revenue Roll um, on a project right now, and I'm pretty optimistic about it. And there's kind of two ways to look at it. Uh, one way is um, is as a tool for list growth, which is true. You're identifying on- anonymous users, and they're essentially how a lot of these tools work is they have access to some um, data lake uh, it, with, with a lot of them, it's live intent. So, I mean, it, pretty much if you've seen an ad on a website, you've been exposed to live intent at some point, they're like a massive programmatic advertiser, like one of the biggest easily. Yeah. And so they have access to, I mean, hundreds of millions, if not a billion email addresses. Right. Mm-hmm. And so what a lot of these identity resolution tools are doing is they're licensing data from live intent. So like, all right, we've got this list of email addresses with, you know, MD5 hashes, whatever it is, and then they're tacking on an identity resolution component, which is sort of part of the cookie list future where yeah. they're able to identify, all right, you know, this is James. He's on his phone this time instead of his computer, but, like, we know who this is. And then what they do is they match that user back to an email address, and they sell it back to you at wholesale pricing. So in some cases, you're paying $0.20 cents an email to collect with those tools. Sometimes mm-hmm. you're paying $0.05 cents an email. Like, it, it can be – really low from like a lead generation cost perspective. The other thing that these tools typically do, which also helps with just like generating revenue in general is they help you trigger your high intent automation. So most of these tools, they'll have, they'll identify anonymous users on your site, for example, who abandoned cart. 
mm-hmm. and then they'll pass that data back to Clavio so that you can actually trigger your abandoned cart automation in Clavio um, in a case where the Clavio cookie actually couldn't identify the user, especially if they're not in your database. Clavio is definitely not going to identify them. Mm-hmm. But then also Clavio's cookie has limitations with how many users on your database it can identify across device. So it's really just amplifying the amount of send volume you can drive through those automations. So between those two things, these tools tend to be very high ROI. I mean, I've seen, I mean, brands I've worked with have seen 11x ROI on some of these. Um, I've seen a screenshot from a brand owner of one of these tools. He had a 90x ROI. Wow. And uh, that blew my mind. So, yeah, it's definitely something that's worth exploring. That's a good slot machine to put your money into. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Um, so do you see that, um, in terms of the identity resolution, in terms of list quality, how does that kind of jive between, uh, have have you done any analysis or read any studies around the quality of acquiring names, potential customers, that list growth through identity resolution as compared to a, um, uh, just let's compare it to a, a, a high intent offer. I mean, wh- where does the where, where's the quality range in that? And I know that's a really, really open ended question. I just wanted to see if you had any uh, thoughts on that. Yeah, for sure. I mean, it's it's definitely not as good as an opt in, but it does sit somewhere between an opt in and a cold email in the sense that you know someone at least spent you know fifteen twenty seconds on your website, they've seen point. your logo, and so if they get sort of an unsolicited email from you saying like, hey, thanks for visiting our site, you know, by the way, we offer these different mm-hmm. range of products, do do do. Um, the response you could expect from that is quite a bit better than you could expect if you're, for example, just buying lists, which I don't recommend for DTC brands. Um, so, um, but yeah, I mean, your, your engagement tends to be lower. Generally with these vendors, I see fairly high open rates, um, and lower CTRs. Um, but the, really the magic is in building the list and, and it's like now that they're on your list, now you can identify them when they're on your site and you can do all these different things. So, But when you think about it, that could really amplify the effectiveness of a paid traffic campaign, right, of all of your paid and traffic investments. Because many of those people that are clicking over from, say, Facebook or Google ad, TikTok, something like that, they come over to the site. They look around for a little bit. They're, they're, they, they, they may not have that that immediate buying intent or desire or whatever. Maybe they're just distracted. And then you're 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 amplifying it by remarketing to them. So it's essentially kind of like a remarketing tool in, in effect. Absolutely. And I, and another thing is, I know retention does this, and I believe revenue roll does as well, where they you can also set it up so that when users are identified on your website, you integrate that with. Facebook and Google to populate your retargeting audiences, your website retargeting. So you don't have to go through all that rigmarole. Exactly. Okay. How how about time on site, page depth, uh, uh, scroll? Can you, with those identity resolution uh, uh, platforms, can you um, input a certain type of on site behavior? that will then match and only go after those those visitors that actually did something other than just show up and bounce. Yeah. And, and that's, I mean, most of these tools offer that. So what we tend to do is just do a time delay on page view. Um, yeah. So the script just won't fire unless a visitor has been on the site. I mean, typically for like at least 30 seconds tends to be the sweet spot, okay. 30 to 60 seconds. Um you can also set it up if you're if you want to be extra cautious. You can set it up so that it only fires, for example, on the second page view. Um, yeah. That's of course going to increase the quality of the data that you're collecting. And and something to take into consideration too, and and this can get into the weeds a little bit, is the amount of data you could possibly collect from your web traffic versus the size of your existing email list is yeah. something to think about. So let's say for example, you actually have really healthy web traffic, but you have a pretty anemic email list. So let's say you're getting 50,000 uniques a month in the U.S., um, but your email list is only 10K, you probably shouldn't take every match that comes your way because yeah. you're very quickly, your list is going to be dominated by those contacts and your spam complaint rate will be higher if, if right. that's the case versus let's say if your email list is bigger, you essentially have more capacity to push these lower intent contacts in because your numbers are likely in check if you're already dealing with a big list of opt-ins. 
And that's really where, where your value comes in. I, I, maybe not all of it, certainly, but a certain piece of the value that you're bringing to customers does have to do with after you have – Let's and I'm just using the identity uh, uh, re- resolution scenario. You are then kind of um, bringing that person back to the site using email – using different sequences, different flows, different tactics, copywriting, so that uh, that they are getting the most out of that uh, technological opportunity, if you exactly. will. Exactly. Yep. And so that's clearly got to be a, a lot of, of what you're doing with, with, uh, with your clients. Now, um, what else can, you, uh, can we talk about in terms of uh, list growth? Let's say somebody has a, a $30,000 uh, thirty thousand dollar, thirty thousand, you know, person email list. W- w- what are your objectives typically? And I know again, this is an open ended question, but where do you like to see that 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 growth go to over time? Say over the next, over, say if somebody works with you for twelve months, what 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 might they be a reasonable expectation in terms of list growth? Yeah, I mean, really, the biggest controlling factor, if it's opt ins or identity resolution, the biggest controlling factor in your list growth is going to be um, how much web traffic you get. Right. Yep. So let's say you're running a pop up and your conversion rate is anywhere from two to five percent. You're like, all right, that's like decent range. Um, and then with identity resolution, sometimes you can match back up to 30 percent of users, sometimes 10 yep. percent. Um, and so and sometimes with these tools, I mean, I would recommend basically doing a free trial and, and essentially just seeing like, all right, how many matches do we actually get? Because it varies from site to site. Mm-hmm. Um and so, and basically you could build a projection on that. So you say, all right, how much web traffic are we getting? Are we expecting that to increase or decrease? Like what is our projected web traffic over the course of the next 12 months? And then based on what is a healthy opt-in unit and what is a good matchback grade on an identity resolution tool, or at least like an acceptable one, um, how many emails could we expect to have, you know, in 12 months, in 24 months? Um, and so, yeah, I mean, if somebody has 30,000 emails, the way I look at it, if I'm just coming in blind, I don't see any reason why in a year's time that couldn't be a hundred thousand or a hundred and fifty thousand. Oh, that's huge. That's massive growth then. Um in terms of automations, what 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 can we talk about in terms of automations? Um how um you know, I'm I've gotta believe that you're learning a lot across different clients, things that are working, and then you're applying those learnings to to, to existing clients. Uh, what um how what, what what can you tell me about automations and, and what's your uh, words of wisdom there and what separates you apart in terms of that? Yeah, I think a big thing about it is there's, I mean, there's a lot of sort of like, there's a perspective that automations are kind of set it and forget it. And in some ways that is true where it's like the, mm-hmm. the biggest step is like actually having the trigger and then having that send a message. Like that's the biggest part of like yeah. the revenue you're going to generate through an automation. But there's tons of optimizations in terms of, you know, uh, what level of intent is the user? What message are you sending them? How many messages? What are the gaps between the messages? And when you really get into those details and dive in, that's where you can start to see more growth. So let's just say as, as an example, you know, I see a lot of brands that maybe have abandoned checkout, but they don't have abandoned cart. You're like, that's a pretty big revenue opportunity, yeah. right? Because that's still a very high level of intent. They're at the cart. They just didn't make it to checkout. Absolutely. Um, so you want abandoned cart. You want abandoned checkout. You want probably multiple welcome series based on different opt-in sources. So your pop-up welcome series is going to be slightly different than, you know, if you're using identity resolution, than if you're, you know, ran a giveaway at some point with another brand, right? You kind of, you want to make sure that that messaging is consistent with how they got on your list in the first place. Um, And so, I mean, you know, you're typically talking at least two or three welcome series. Um, and, And the content can be pretty similar, especially after the first email. It's mostly just about making sure that first email kind of, at least acknowledges how they got here in the first place. You follow up on the offer, whatever that was. Right. So, yeah, you're talking about a couple of welcome series. And then you also have lower intent um, automations you can create. So you can do product abandonment. So someone viewed a product and then they left the site. You can work with that, right? That's an intent signal you can work with. And so, and it, it depends brand to brand, like how many SKUs, what are the hero products, et cetera. Sometimes it even makes sense to send, let's say, for example, a brand has 12 SKUs, but like, really the vast majority of the revenue comes from two of them. It's it's worth actually having dedicated content for those specific products Mm -hmm. where it's like, you know, somebody viewed your $50 protein 
and then they abandon. It's like send them follow-up education about the protein. You're not necessarily going like hard for the sale, not sending them a coupon code right away, but you're just saying like, hey, here's why our protein is better than the other proteins out there, et cetera. Um, that could be powerful. And I mean, you can go all the way up to site abandonment, which we've done for some clients where it's like someone visited the site, they are on our email list and they left for some reason. Mm -hmm. And that's, you know, even lower intent. That's a, kind of like further up the funnel, so to speak. And so, I mean, you can generate revenue through that. And then so, but really like the big dividing line is like pretty much everything I just described is, um, would be considered um, like a pre-purchase or like a prospecting sequence. Somebody has expressed intent to buy, but they haven't bought yet. And mm -hmm. then you have an entire other set of sequences that are post-purchase. Mm -hmm. So you're talking about, I mean, there's there's tremendous value even in optimizing your um, order confirmation, shipping confirmation, Absolutely. sending a, a customer thank you note from the founder can be great, um, doing product education, right? So it's like, okay, they just bought this product. Let's make sure they know how to use it, right? And let's yeah. make sure they know how great it is. Um, and then, and, and also like building anticipation for like when that product does arrive, they're like, they're ready for it. And then, you know, even beyond that, you have uh, like win back automations are very common, highly recommended, where it's like, let's say if you have a product with a repurchase rate where realistically you should expect a lot of your customers should be buying, let's say every 30 or 60 days, if somebody hasn't bought in 70 days, it's worth reinitiating a conversation with that customer and saying like, hey, you know, do, 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 mm. whatever it is, personalizing that as much as you can based on what they bought. Um, that can be powerful. And then, of course, basic things like review requests, follow us on social media and whatnot. So there's like be between everything I just described, it's like it, that's like 10 automations. That's a lot. And, 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 and the reality is you're doing a massive amount of segmentation and analysis based on behaviors, results, um, you know, throughout the customer journey. And I love I absolutely love what you said about post purchase about thank yous, about the, about the uh, delivery process, all that. That's so crucial to um, – uh, and, and is directly related to improving and increasing lifetime value as, exactly. as well as future average order value, all that stuff. And you just simply don't hear that talked about nearly as much as it should be. So that's really refreshing to hear you, to, to hear you drill down into that. Um, how about promotional cadence? That was the that was the third thing in the list that, that you talked about. Why don't we uh, spend a little a few minutes on that? Yeah, I, I mean, so really the playbook here, I'll just give it away right here on the pod. Um, really, the playbook is um, I, I like to call it the infinity messaging model, uh, which is kind of a fancy name for it. But <laughs> it's it's because you know if you map, for example, the size of your segment, you know, on a vertical axis. And then you map like which day of the promotion you're on on the horizontal axis. It looks like an infinity symbol. That's why I call it that. Okay. Um, and so basically the, the theory is, you know, when you launch a promotion, you want to cast a fairly wide net, right? Because you're essentially announcing this is a new promotion, um, whatever it is. It could be Mother's Day, Black Friday, et cetera. And, and a wide net, I, I think our recommendation can vary based on engagement and deliverability. But just as an example, um, anyone who's opened or clicked or visited the site in the last 90 days, at minimum, you should be letting them know, like, hey, we just launched a promotion. Um, and then as sequentially, as you're sending more emails, you scope that segment smaller and smaller. So it's like you go from a 90-day segment, maybe a day a day later or, or you know, the day after next, you send to the 60-day. Then after that, you send to the 30. And then maybe you work your way all the way down to, like, 30-day clickers or 14-day openers, right? And then as the promotion approaches its close, you have urgency on your site, right? Because the opportunity is about to go away. So you start opening the segments back up. You go back to your 30, you go back to your 60, you go back mm -hmm. to your 90, potentially even back up to your 180. And then it, just taking Black Friday as an example, if somebody bought from you Black Friday last year and they haven't bought all year, yeah. the next time that they're most likely to buy is Black Friday this year. So it's like right. – like, don't completely discount a user who hasn't engaged with the brand in 12 months because maybe they're only interested in your best offer, right? And yeah. so you want to you want to be casting a fairly wide net. And, of course, along the way, you want to keep track of your unsubscribes, your spam complaints. You may need to make a couple of adjustments on the fly. But generally speaking, that structure works extremely well. And for most promotions, you could be sending an email almost every day. Mm -hmm. um, but because, the, like, really the hypothesis behind it is that a user who is mo who's more recently engaged mm -hmm. is going to forgive you more for being persistent. 
And so that's kind of the operating theory. And then the, and we just map that out into a, a cadence with different segments and it works super well. Obviously given this a ton of thought, how about the one thing that comes to mind is, is list scrubbing. Do you actively scrub the list for, for quality? Is that, could you talk about that? Cause that's something that's definitely intriguing to me, especially with what I'd like to talk about next, which is, you know, with, with Google and Yahoo and the changes that they're make, making in terms of their email delivery. Could we uh, talk about scrubbing as, and then maybe bridge into how it relates to those new kind of guidelines, if you will, for lack of a better word? For sure. Um, most of the time, if you're dealing with a good ESP, it's basically going to be handling bounces for you. And so the way most ESPs work, uh, and, and that's email service provided, by the way, that's like Klaviyo, Active Campaign, whatever you're using. The way most of them work is if you get a hard bounce, which basically means the email is invalid or the mailbox just isn't available anymore, uh, generally speaking, the ESP will just unsubscribe them for you. Um, and then soft bounces can be things like the inbox was full or for whatever reason, the receiving server couldn't receive the email at that particular time. So, And most ESPs will have a, their own policy about if let's say if a soft bounce happens two or three times in a row, then they unsubscribe them on your behalf. So generally speaking, bounces aren't something you have to worry a ton about, especially if you're validating up front, which I'll talk about next. Um, but it's worth checking on the policies of your ESPs because some of them don't. And if that's the case, then, you know, at least once a week, go build a segment of recent bounces and just take them off the list. Okay. Um, it's just going to hurt your deliverability if you just keep mailing emails that are bouncing. Um, the, uh, and then the other, the other big part of list scrubbing is validation. Um, and that you definitely want to do when emails come in. And again, this is something that some ESPs help you out with, but there's some really low cost vendors out there that will validate for you for pennies on the dollar. So, I mean, one that I've used on multiple occasions is called Mailfloss. So just, you can go to mailfloss.com. Mm -hmm. Depending on your list size, it's like, it, it's like pennies again, like per contact and it'll integrate with your ESP. So then if a new email comes in, let's even just say someone mistyped their email, you know, it comes in and then Mailfloss will test it to see, okay, is this a valid email? If it's not, then it'll just unsubscribe it or label it so that you can come back to it later. Uh, I definitely recommend, you know, doing something like that just to make sure that all of your inbound emails are definitely valid and mailable. Um, outside of that, so there's kind of competing philosophies um, in terms of scrubbing for engagement. So there's a, there's a lot of email guys out there that will basically tell you that if a contact hasn't opened or clicked in 90 days or 180 days, so that is, which is essentially six months, uh, you should just unsubscribe them. Um, I, we don't do that because we segment every email that we send in the first place, right? So okay. we're already segmenting based on engagement. So for the most part, if a contact hasn't recently engaged, we're not mailing them. And it's not like it's adding that much to your bill. Um, right. Again, because Klaviyo and, and all these ESPs are so affordable, it's like generally leaving the contacts in the database. It just means that you have the opportunity to mail them. Um, and, you know, just like that Black Friday example. Right. That's a great example. If, if for some reason a contact's been on your list for a year, uh, they just haven't done anything, but they might buy again from you during Black Friday, yeah, just leave them on the list. Just right. don't mail them that often. Right. That makes total sense. Now, in terms of how you work with, with, with clients, I mean, what, what does that look like in terms of, uh, of, of, uh, time frame? Um, what do you look for? And how do you charge and all that stuff? Because I think that would be – there's no question in my mind that, that you bring a massive amount of value to your clients. I mean, clearly you know exactly what you're talking about. You've given us a ton of thought and can speak very intelligently about everything. So if I was a, uh, if I was a, a potential customer, what types of questions would I, you know, would I be coming to you with and how would you answer those? For sure. I mean, really, like what answers most of our questions is we we do an audit in advance of the Klaviyo account, and we also sort of check that back against what's happening uh, in their um, in their uh, e-commerce platform, typically Shopify. I mean, our ideal stack is Klaviyo and, and Shopify, and yeah. if they're using SMS, I love Attentive. That's another controversial opinion, but they have the best delivery network. So it's like if they're on Attentive, if it's like Klaviyo, Attentive, Shopify, I'm like, all right, sweet. Like we've got the right tools. Um, but you know, no, no harm, no foul with other SMS tools. They're great too. We can work with them. Um, so yeah, I mean, the big thing is we basically will look at the accounts. We'll look at Shopify. 
and we'll just identify what are the biggest gaps. So it's like if you're missing a ton of automations or if your list growth is, that, is out of whack, we'll just set an order of priorities where it's like, all right, this is the first thing that we want to do. Then we want to do this list of, you know, 10 or 15 things. And generally speaking, we can get a brand ramped up in the space of about 30 days. Sometimes it takes a little bit longer, but mm -hmm. we can put all the right basics in place. It's like you've got the automations now, you've got uh, list growth tools, like all that's underway. And then we can transition to um, essentially like a, a kind of a maintenance situation where it's like we're supporting promotions, we're monitoring your deliverability, um, we're making sure that content's going out regularly, optimizing and whatnot, and providing you know monthly reporting on email KPIs, revenue, and whatnot. So uh, with some brands, if there's a ton of setup involved, we might charge a setup fee, you know, that's north of like 10 or 15,000, just depends on what's involved. And yeah. then after that, our fees would drop off quite a bit because we're just sort of like making sure that it, the engine keeps running. Um, and then with some clients, if they have a bunch set up, we might just put them on a retainer to start. And, and generally speaking, our full service retainers are around $5,000. Mm -hmm. The one thing that we do that's a little bit different than uh, what some other brands do is uh, we are willing to work on a performance basis. So with some brands, we have a lower retainer, but we take a, a small percentage of their last click attributed revenue, which is basically the most conservative revenue attribution model there is. Mm -hmm. um, and, and it's like, you know, clearly like we generate this revenue. Someone clicked on this email and they immediately bought a product. Like we'll take credit for that sale. Yep. And then we'll, we'll charge some percentage they're comfortable with. So we're willing to negotiate there. And, and like in terms of like ideal client, I mean, generally speaking, if the list is less than, 30,000 users, and if they're getting less than 30,000 unique visitors per month from the U.S., um, it doesn't, our fees don't make the most sense in terms of, like, projected ROI when you take into account all the costs of software and services. Uh, but, you know, we're willing to help out and, like, provide some recommendations so that they can mm -hmm. keep uh, plugging away. But generally speaking, if a brand is doing more than that, it's like, all right, we know we can come in here, we can plug in a bunch of our strategies, we can fully manage these channels and provide a ton of value to our clients. Now, in terms of the, the, the performance component, how, how do you how do you judge? I mean, what platform are you using to um, determine the the attribution to last click? I mean, are you using GA? Are you using uh, Shopify? Are you using what Clavio? I've seen some crazy no. reports from Clavio. <laughs> We're not so, using Clavio attribution. Um, the and, and, and you know nothing wrong with Clavio attribution, but there there is some uh, some 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 sky dust in that number. Um, yeah. The uh, typically we're using the Shopify report because everybody yeah. has that it's default. Um, we're appending UTMs to the to the URLs we're sending through, and then if we're seeing sales yeah. come from those UTMs, we're like, all right, we're going to take credit for that sale. If they have their if they hired you and they have their GA4 really well built out, um, yeah. then you know we can work within GA4 as well. Okay, so you are using UTMs within the within the Clavio platform. That's awesome. Um, let's see, what else do I have here? This has been a great a great conversation. Do, is there anything that actually, you know, what I would like to talk about is SMS. Could yeah. you give me a quick uh, a quick overview on on what you do in terms of SMS for for the for the clients that you're working with? For sure. So uh, with SMS, the uh, the opportunities for growth are much more limited, um, and and a lot of that just comes down to the fact that. TCPA compliance is much more strict than can spam compliance mm -hmm. in the U.S. And so you have to have that double opt-in, right? And so, you know, you, you want to work with, and it's essentially like your SMS growth pretty much comes down to exclusively your, um, your, your, how good your pop-ups are, right? Yeah. And so you can set up a two-step pop-up. You have an offer, collect their email, then collect their phone mm -hmm. number. Um, Attentive has a great like two-step where it's like you tap the button. It pre-fills an opt-in message. They send, yeah. you send the message. So, um, yeah, that, I mean, with SMS, you're going to see slower list growth. And again, it's going to be projected based on your site traffic and your pop-up conversion rate. And, but that being said, the revenue per recipient that you can expect from SMS tends to be far higher. Also, we tend to implement very similar strategies, uh, as we do on email in terms of like you have opportunities for welcome, you have opportunities for, um, abandoned checkout, et cetera. Mm -hmm. Um, but uh, the cadence should be uh, – the volume of your messages should be quite a bit lower. About half of yeah. what you're sending on email is generally okay. a good rule of thumb. Because it's right – it's like – is that because it's like right in their face since it's on their phone? It's a very intimate channel, right? And yeah. your open rates are like 90%, right? So if your emails are getting, let's say, a 40% open rate, then it's like you – basically you have to send two emails 
before you actually got the same number of impressions as you would get with an SMS, mm-hmm. right? And so uh, a lot of that just comes down to keeping the unsubscribes low and make sure you're not getting TCPA complaints about people who be like, wait, how did I get on this list? So, um, yeah, but, I mean, apart from that, uh, a lot of the strategies are very similar, like the, the segmentation, the promotional cadence, the automations and yeah. whatnot. It's just lower volume. Uh, but that being said, I have seen – SMS lists that are half the size or even a third of the size of an email list generate the same amount of revenue. So okay. if if there's a brand out there that's not doing it, it's like that's also a huge revenue opportunity. It's like mm-hmm. just set up that SMS channel and make sure you're you know sending a couple texts a month and you like should be able to drive some pretty serious revenue that way. What percentage of clients uh, that, that you work with or or just in general um, are you helping them with email and and SMS? Both of those, both of those two uh, channels. I would say typically we're working with both. You are okay. Yeah. And one thing I don't believe I asked you in terms of copywriting. So are you are you doing the copywriting for the emails as well? Yeah, we'll do the content, the graphic design, the yeah. whole nine yards. Yeah. Okay. Excellent. Is there anything else I, I should have asked you that I didn't ask you, Ben? Um, I don't know. I know you mentioned uh, before we hopped on here that you thought about diving into the whole deliverability update with Google and Yahoo. Yeah, well, you know, if you have time, why don't we talk about that? I'd love to. I'd love to hear about that. For sure. So, I mean, the big thing there is it's really the big ISPs. There, there was a lot of people in my uh, in my space freaking out a little bit in November when they were originally announced. Uh, but really, as time has gone on, it's become more and more clear that they're just enforcing what are truly the best practices. Yeah, and so. The two big components of the update, one is making sure that your sending is authenticated, and then the other one is making sure that your spam complaints stay low, um, both of which are just generally good practices to begin with, even before the update. So, I mean, it, we can get into the weeds here, but the basics are your DKIM and your SPF records are essentially authenticating the sending. So what that does is when you have those records in place, um, when you send an email, you're telling Google and Yahoo that like, yes, this is a legitimate sender from this domain. It's already been Uh, verified. Exactly. Um, And then your DMARC record is essentially setting a policy for unauthenticated sends. That's what that does. And so, I mean, the most common DMARC policy is P equals none, which means don't really do anything about it. Um, P equals quarantine just means that you're sending that email directly to the spam folder. So it's like, hey, Mm -hmm. if an email comes from our domain and it's not authenticated, just put it straight in spam. Yeah. Um, and then there's P equals reject, which means never reaches the inbox at all. It gets completely blocked. Um, and, and for most, like P equals none is going to be fine. You're working with an opt-in list. You've got your, your, uh, your domains, uh, your, your domain authenticated for sending. Um, there has been some edge cases like where if you're working with bigger and bigger brands, I have like we had one client at one point about two years ago where people were actually sending fake PayPal invoices from our domain. Um, and so in that case, P equals reject. Uh, solve the problem for us. It just meant anytime one of those emails went out, Google and Yahoo knew they're like, yeah, this is not legitimate. Just completely block it out. Um, and so that can solve some problems for you. But if you do set up a DMARC policy that's fairly strict, you just want to make sure that everything that's sending a, an email, I don't care if it, it could be Eventbrite, it could be Google Workspace, like everything has to be authenticated because if it's not, it's just going to go straight to spam. So yes. um, that tends to be the policy there. And then with the spam complaint rate, I mean, basically the new benchmark is to stay under 0.3. Um, and to some that sounds strict, but if you're dealing with an opt-in list and you're handling your identity resolution contacts in a way that's, that's solid, uh, that's not really going to be something you're going to have to worry too much about, yeah. but it is, I do highly recommend that basically everybody sets up Google Postmaster. It's a free tool. You can just go to postmaster.google.com. Uh, you can set it up. And then what that will do is it'll tell you exactly what Google thinks about your domain. So it'll tell you domain reputation, IP reputation, um, it'll tell you uh, your spam complaint rate according mm-hmm. to Google. Oh, really? And yeah, exactly. So you can just literally see the number. So you're like, oh, on Tuesday we were. So you're at- not guessing. Like exactly. That's 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 huge. That's postmaster.google.com. Um, that's a that's a great tip. That's 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 worth the listen. As I as I said at the beginning, I knew it was going to be valuable. So it's I was looking at those at those reports. Yeah, because it's kind of like a sky is falling. And I wondered how that was going to impact, you know, an agency like yourself who's focused on email and and getting all those emails in the inbox. So it's not a sky is falling. It's kind of like 
business as usual for the people that were doing the right thing before and the and the ones that the, the bad players are the ones that, that are going to feel the pain. Is that a correct way to look at it? Yeah, that's fair. The other thing is worth keeping in mind, too, is that these these new requirements only apply to what they consider to be bulk senders. So it, it's only going to be enforced if you're mailing more than 5,000 Gmail or Yahoo contacts on a given day. So if your list is very small, it's not something to worry a ton about, but it's good to put this stuff in place regardless. And is that, I also read something that this is going to apply to personal emails only and not to a, a business domain. Is that correct? Have you heard of that? That, I, I haven't heard that. As far as okay. I know, it's it's really any sending domain. It's any sending domain. Um, okay. Yeah. Okay, great. If it's if if you're if it's a personal email, uh, there's a good chance you're sending less than five thousand emails a day. So right, uh, right. you're probably fine on a personal front. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, cool. That was an awesome overview. Um, great. So how can how can people get in touch with you then? Absolutely. Uh, I post on LinkedIn and Twitter all the time, so feel free to punch out my name. I'll pop right up. Um, and then other than that, if you're actually interested in in talking to us and maybe working with us, you can just go to nobledigital.co um, and and we'll pop right up there too. Excellent. Well, thank you very, very much. That was a, that was a, an exceptional episode. It was value packed. Um, I really appreciate your time and um, we will talk to you soon. Absolutely. Thanks, Scott. Thanks a lot, Ben.